Okay, I'm going to start working on the servo installs and the linkages. Uh, starting the stab here. So again, the BLS-173. So the first thing is to put the rails in. Um, so what I'm going to do to set the height of the rails is I'm just going to measure that. And they're about, you know, the, across the grommets with the little eyelets in there. They are about, you know, 4.6 if you kind of squish them down a little bit. Four and a half millimeters kind of squished down. Um, so that'll really set the height to the top of the rail. And then <clears throat> I'm going to I'm actually going to sit them down at a bit of an angle. So I'm not going to set them exactly level. I'm going to set the back down and really that's just so I get a you know, I get the servo sort of pointed up at the at the horn, right? Because it's not, they're not in the same plane. You know, the arm's going to be up here and the servo's down here. So those ball bearing links don't pivot in this direction. You know, they only really pivot this way. So I'm going to make sure that servo's kind of pointed. And it doesn't have to be super precise, but it, it just, just so you're not putting a lot of undue strain on that, on that, uh, on that bearing link. So to do that, all I'm really going to do is I'm just going to, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to roughly set this flush at the back here and just sort of push that down and just with my ruler, just kind of make sure that it's flat point of there. So that's fine. So, and then I'm going to use the depth setting on this and I'm just going to go down to the top of this grommet and push it down. And it's basically going to sit about four millimeters deep in there. So, Take my servo back out. So I know the front one, I'm going to be the top of that rail, you know, is going to be four and a half deep to accommodate the, to accommodate the, uh, the grommets. And then the back one is going to be four and a half plus the four point four, four millimeters. So it's going to be eight and a half millimeters deep. So I'm going to take my rails and these are just quarter inch uh, spruce and I've kind of already fit sized them up to, to fit here. Um, I'm going to take the rails and I'm going to use the depth gauge just to sort of set that rail and then I'm just going to tack it in place with some CA. So I'm going to go four and a half. I'm going to set this to four and a half, roughly. You know, and I'm just going to make sure that this is... I usually start with it a bit up and then just sort of press it down into place so it's level. And then I'm just going to use some medium, some thin CA just to sort of Pack it down. And I'll come back with some medium and just fill in the gaps. And so for the back one, I'm going to go eight and a half. So I'm going to set that caliper to eight and a half millimeters. Eight and a half, so the same thing. You just sort of set that rail down in the right spot. And then again, just some thin CA just to tack it down. Now make sure it's level. You know, so you got to kind of double check both sides. You do find sometimes they don't go in there exactly level. Sorry, you got them both tacked in place. You know, I just use a little medium CA. Just in the kind of corners, just to sort of fill it things up a bit. You know, let that cure up, and that's basically your rails in place. So go ahead and repeat that for both both the stab halves. So the servo rails in. I usually let that CA kind of cure up on its own. I don't like using kicker around the foam. Um, if you got foam safe kicker, I guess. Also, usually you'll need to do a bit of a relief. I just use a bit of a round file in there um, for the servo lead. Just to make a little bit of a, a groove on the bottom of that of this front rail. So you can go ahead and fit your servo in there. You know, it should get up in there real nice. So there we go. So if you push it down against the rails, you know, double check. Oh, there we got our our arm is basically pointed at the 
at the horn. So it doesn't have to be perfect. There's always a little bit of play, but it works out pretty good. So, so now I drill the holes. So to drill them, I just use my cordless Dremel. I'm running just a small, slightly smaller than a sixteenth inch bit, um, a .055. A sixteenth is probably fine, but it might be just a bit big for the standard screws. Um, I do just use the standard screws that come with a of servos, but whatever you want to use, that's fine. And I just put this on low and just drill out the holes. I'm not too particular. So they're there, drilled out. So, really, I'm just going to go screw these in place now. So let's take our screws and put them in there. There we go, so there's our servo, basically mounted and installed. So, now we really need to get it ready for the, the linkage, and again, I'm gonna use the six point arm. So we basically gotta program the servo um, into place on, for this elevator half. So we're gonna go ahead and uh, work on programming, getting the servo set up. So I'm gonna start with a brand new model, just because um, I think it'll be more more interesting to see a program from scratch rather than copying something else. So really I'm just going to go new and this on a 32MZ. So model type, um, obviously I'm not going to have all that stuff. I'm going to have two ailerons and then I'm going to have elevator. So elevator, two elevators, right? <clears throat> and a rudder. So on a monoplane, this is basically for a monoplane. So two ailerons and Two independent elevators and a rudder, airplane type. So I'm just gonna say yes. So it's gonna ask me now, do I wanna link a receiver? I'm not gonna do that right at this time. So for me, cause I fly mode four or whatever, I fly my ailerons on the left stick and my rudder on the right stick. I'm gonna change this function so you can see how that works. I'm gonna switch aileron J1, right is currently on the right stick. I'm gonna switch that to J4. Close, and rudder right I'm going to switch from J4 to J1, close, and I'm going to switch my trims now, because you got to switch it separately, so I'm going to switch trim 1 to trim 4, so that's my ailerons, and back in the rudder right I'm going to switch trim 4 to trim 1. So that basically gets my setting correct now for me. Also what I'm going to do while I'm in here, I'm going to go back into trims, you'll notice they start off with a trim rate of 30% and a step of 4, 30% is fine, that's just how fast it moves. I'm going to reset this step down to as low as possible to one. And I'm going to leave all these combined. Elevator, I'm going to do the same thing. Set the step down to one. Throttle, I'm going to actually leave this. I'm, in fact, I might even increase it to like 10. So it moves quite a bit faster. You can, you can adjust this depending on whatever you like for your, your incremental, um, you know, tr idle, I guess, adjustment. And ATL, trim mode ATL, which means it's only active below half stick. And, you know, it's a normal direction. So you're going to leave that alone. And rudder, I'm going to set this all the way down to one. So that really has my trims and everything set up. So um, for the servo, we obviously need to figure out which channel. It's an S bus, so I need to program a channel into it. So if you go into um, your function menu, you'll see where everything was programmed, right? So aileron was channel one, elevator channel two, throttle three, um, rudder four, aileron number two is six, and elevator number two is seven. So generally for me, I like to make the first ailerons and elevators the left-hand side of the model. Um, and it's just to keep it straight in my head which one goes where. So because I'm programming the left-hand elevator first, I'm gonna call this servo channel number two. So we gotta go now program that servo to channel two. Um, so back out of here and really on the 32 it's quite simple there's a there's a cover here and there is a connection right there looks like a servo plug connection and you really just plug the servo into that. You don't need to run a Y harness and power it externally like you did with the uh, with the 18, you can just go straight into there. So we're gonna go back out now into our system menu. If 
find the second page, SBUS Servo. So I'm going to recall it. This is an old servo, so it had already been programmed to channel 4, so I'm going to change this to 2. And I usually leave all this stuff the same. Sometimes I do change the neutral offset, I'm going to change this back to 0. And that's the same effect as using your sub trim. So whether you want to use sub trim or you want to use the neutral offset to adjust the center position of your servo, really up to you. I mean, if you put it in here, it's just you don't see it in the sub trim. So I'm going to go to zero here just so we do it all in the sub trim. Travel adjust, I leave the same. This dead band, the gain, all that stuff, I leave the same. I don't change any of that. Um, so when you got it set the way you like it, uh, I just hit right. And it goes and programs the server. Now it should be on the elevator. So you'll notice you'll hear it when I'm moving the elevator. So that servo is now set for our elevator. So really that's, we're done with the servo programming at this point. So really to do this, um, you're going to need your receiver. I'm going to do this with a 7008. So whether you use a 7008, 7006, 7003, 7108, uh, which is the brand new version of this one, um, it's all the same. The same process, any fastest receiver basically works the same. Um, you can use a terminal block if you want and a mail to mail extension to get from the terminal block to the receiver. It's helpful if you're doing more than one servo at a time, setting them up. And something to power, receiver battery to power everything up. So, really, first thing we got to do is we got to bind this receiver to this transmitter. So, I'm just going to go back. I'm going to go to here. So, I'm going to use. So I'm going to use fastest, 18 channel, um, single receiver, right, activate the telemetry, so I usually don't change those, so I'm just going to go link, so it'll link this receiver up, so it's going to bring me to this page, the battery fail safe voltage, now you can change this, um, if you're running a LiPo, you could run this up higher, um, this is really going to give you a, a, an indication if your battery goes too low. So it's a good idea to, to set that you know, appropriately. Probably on a LiPo you want it up in that like 6.5 volt range. Um, so you can go, go ahead and change that. And then really I'm going to link this. So it's going to say power on your receiver. So I'm just going to plug my battery in. The black goes down. Any channel doesn't matter and it should go green. So it went green so it's now linked. So really you'll get this link number in here so you can close and you're, there's your link right. So my, if I go back to that screen everything's set properly. So really this receiver is ready to go and, and control whatever we need it to. I'm going to go back now I'm going to plug uh, this into the S bus slot. So I'm not going to use S bus 2 I'm going to use SBUS and the reason for that is really just communication on the if you're running telemetry sensors you use SBUS too. If you're not, you really want to run your servos in SBUS. Um, it's, it's, I don't know, it's more stable is what I'm told. Um, generally there's a lot of, especially if you're running telemetry, there's a lot of data transmitting to SBUS too. So the, the, the sort of accepted um, practice is to run, run your servos on SBUS. Um, and run your data, run your telemetry on SBUS too. There's no negative effect for running your servos on SBUS. So I'm just going to plug my terminal block into the SBUS with that connector, and I'm going to plug my servo just anywhere in the terminal block. Doesn't really matter. And then I'm really just going to plug the battery into the terminal block as well, just to power everything up. So you'll notice when you do this, you don't have a servo working on your elevator. The reason for that is is because the default mode of these is probably channel A or mode A. Um, so this is actually channel 8 instead of an S bus channel. So you do need to switch the mode. So how do you switch the mode? So you need uh, you know the little screwdriver or whatever that came with your transmitter. So you need a tiny little screwdriver um, to activate this mode button. This link mode button at the back here. So you need to hold that down while you power up the receiver. So this is a bit of a trick. So you hold that down, you power it up. And it'll flash. So it's flashing once because I'm in mode A. 
right? So every time you press it, you should go to the next mode. So now it's in two beeps. So that's mode B, right? So I want to be in mode B. So mode B gives you channels 1, 2, 7, and S bus on the last one, and then S bus 2 um, in your S bus 2 port. S bus 2 is always S bus 2. So sort of the next thing we need to do is get the this arm parallel to this hinge line. So on a you know normal, if you were exactly right angles, it would be easy, but in this case it's a little bit tricky. So I use my squares like I did to come up with all these angles previously, right? And I drew based that parallel line, I kind of drew it as close as I could kind of get it um, to the center of the servo. I'm a little bit off, but on a Futaba servo horn, there are numbers. So every number is a slightly different orientation um, relative on the spline. And the reason why that's important is once you have the number, you can easily pick up another servo horn, put the same number in place, and away you go. So as you rotate this around, um, every arm will line up slightly differently. So what you want to do, you know, basically just start and go, okay, well that's close. You know, you can you can pretty quick narrow it down which ones are close and which ones are not. And you go around there until you get pretty close. So in my case, number four is pretty close. You know, and once you get fairly close, you know, you can use a drill bit or piece of piano or something. Anyways, I just put my square in there, and you can see, okay, I'm not exactly in line with the line I made, right? Like, it's it's definitely out a few degrees. <clears throat> so in that case, now I'm just going to use subtrim. So I'm going to go on my transmitter here. You know, I'm going to go to linkage. Under subtrim, and I know I'm in channel 2. So I'm really going to put this on here, and I'm going to adjust the subtrim. You know, until this is closer. So that's 20. So now if you were to look at, so if you look at where I'm at now, you know, that's, that's pretty close. In fact, it might have even been too much. Maybe 10 is enough. And you can play around with that. The key point is here is you got to be perfect. So there we go. Actually, 10 is pretty much about right. So once we have that, now we know. Now we know that that servo is is in the right spot and it's geometrically correct, right? It's this this linkage will be perpendicular to the hinge line going back to this part. So we can go ahead and start getting our linkage parts ready. Now remember which which uh, number on the servo arm you used because that's you know, if you take the servo arm off to put in your thing, you'll obviously want to put it back in the same spot. So I'm going to go ahead now and screw my my bearing links on here and on here and get ready to start doing my, my linkage up. These are the bearing links I'm going to use. Um, so for these, you got to make sure they go in the right way. There's that side and then there's that side. All right, so the bearing can come out completely. So if you were to put this side... you know, down on the servo. You can imagine that this could actually, this plastic piece could pop right off and the bearing would be left. So you gotta make sure it goes this way. Always, always, right? And then there's a little space that goes underneath there. So really, you know, you have your screw and then a little spacer, there's a little black spacer part that basically goes underneath there. And then that's gonna thread into your, into your horn. So if you don't do it that way, you definitely run the risk of, of having a control linkage failure. So I've got that screwed onto my servo arm. Good idea to put like some CA or some Loctite on these. Um, and this is on the number four, which lined up the best with my servo. So I can go ahead and put that back on. Okay. And there we go. And so at this point, I noticed, you know, um, that this is this needs to be reversed. So I'm going to go into the radio here and reverse this quick. So that will affect my sub trim. Um, so I'm going to have to put that the other way, which is fine. 
since we know it's a minus 10, so I'm just going to go in here and um, reverse this in the linkage middle server elevator. So, and I'm going to go back to the sub trim and flip this to positive 10. So now I'm back to where I started. Okay, so now you got that on, and you know you double check the position. Are you're happy with your orientation? Um, really, I'm going to do the linkage now. So I may not do this in the exact conventional way. So all I do is I really just use a carbon rod, um, and I glue this in. So there's no adjustment. There's no, you know, there's nothing to to tweak it afterwards. So you got to make sure that you're you're happy with your setup. It works best if you already know. Um, you know what your what like what position you're going to be and and all that sort of stuff just cuz if you do move some of that stuff later you got no ability to really adjust this um so you're going to you know you need to clamp the the tip obviously up so it can't move so you're centered um you know so that needs to be firmly in place and this is a one one trip deal if you mess this up you basically wreck both um horns and you gotta redo them. So all I really do is you know you want to get some paper towel to kind of protect your your covering underneath here because you don't want it dripping everywhere if you do get some CA drip. Um, and I just put some medium CA you know roughing up the carbon rod all that sort of stuff as best you can. I do drill these I did, you know if you gotta drill them out this is two millimeter rod you don't want them super tight in there, you want a little bit of play just so you can easily slide them in and out. So really I'm gonna I'm basically gonna put it in one end here and I'm gonna do it. You have a bit of time, but I'm basically gonna put a bit of CA in here. Not much, but a bit of CA in the rod. You don't want a ton. And I'm gonna you gotta take this off. So you do have to remember which position you had it in. Bit of CA in there. I get a bit more on the rod. And I'm just going to push this on. And I'm just going to rotate it a bit just to kind of work that CA in there. And then I'm really going to put this back in position. And at that point, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to kind of twist this rod around a bit. Um, just to make sure the CA is worked in everywhere and I got it in the right position. And also, if you are a bit tight on everything, um, you know, that'll allow the allow things to 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 sort of loosen up um, and fall into place because you don't you don't want this so tight that if you put pressure on something all of a sudden you take your clamp off and the trims move then you're then you're in trouble but you don't want it so loose that your see it doesn't make a good bond so really we're just gonna let that sit in there and cure up nicely and when that's done uh, you're essentially finished your your linkage so once this is cured up you know go ahead and pull off your clamp and you'll see, you know, nicely centered um, and nice, nice tight linkage. There's basically no, no slop in there at all. Right, and you got kind of our full movement. Right, and again, there's our. So if you want to trim these are off, go ahead. You know, put your service screw in. <clears throat> so one thing that probably gets asked is why not run like I left my ATVs at a hundred percent. I'm in here. So you notice everything is left at a hundred percent. And I guess why is that? <clears throat> So really everything is based on that ATV percentage in the Futaba, so mixing all, mixing trims, all that stuff. So if we go and put a bunch of trim in on the elevator. I'm just going to put in, so you know, we've got some, some trim in there, it's pretty minor, but I mean it's, it's in there a bit if it'll focus. You can kind of see it. So if I were to go now and change that ATV on the elevator and I put an up trim. So you hear that servo moving? That's now actually changing 
the trim point. So you hear that servo moving again? Very, very subtle. <clears throat> so it does the same thing for mixing, it does the same thing for for sub trim. So if you're gonna change your ATVs, say to 120 or 110, do it at the beginning. Do it right off the bat. Um, and then don't mess with them because it will, if you change them throughout the trimming process, let's say I was to trim the plane and put in that trim and then go, oh, I want more throw, I'm going to change my ATV. You know, I have this, I have this, uh, this consequence now to deal with. So in lieu of that, I just use, I just use AFR. If I do want more throw, um, I just use the AFR function. And I guess really, you know, the linkage menu is, I guess, the way I view it is this is kind of global change, right? So anything you change in the linkage menu affects the model in its entirety, right? Uh, whereas anything you change in the model menu, which is that button, like AFR, for instance, this has no impact now to trims and those sorts of things. So, you know, if you set your ATV to 140, you actually decrease the, I guess, resolution of your mixing. So... 1% mix at 140 ATV is not is more throw than 1% mix at 100% ATV. So I typically like to leave those at 100 and and use the use the AFR dual rate to gain more throw. So if I really wanted more throw on the elevator, you know, I would I would simply dial up my my AFR dual rate screen instead. Hopefully that makes makes sense. And so Typically, I'll leave. But the only thing I might do more ATV on is rudder, just simply to get, you know, a, a ton of throw for stall turns. But even that, um, usually you can get enough out of the dual rate. So in the in the dual rate AFR, you can get more than 140 percent. So there's really no no reason to use the ATV in my mind. But the only thing I do in that screen is. I would just change the limit up if I wanted more than 135%. So for instance, if you know if I'm trying to get you know on the elevator, let's go back. Let's set this to 155, right? So you know, this last little bit of throw here, you know, it's it's kind of dead, right? And the reason for that is go back to the linkage menu. Um you see we're maxed out right there where it hits the red? Like we can't go anymore. So if I actually go to the limit and increase that, you know, I'm going to get more through. So you can, you can kind of uh, get a little more if you change those limits and use your, use your uh, AFR screen. So I'm just going to reset that. So that's effectively, you know, how I set up the linkages. Um, I'm going to go ahead now and do, basically they're all the same, rudder, ailerons, elevator, uh, no different, right, perpendicular um, between your servo arm and the hinge line and, and basically the linkage perpendicular to the hinge line. You know, I, I set them up all with carbon rod, two millimeter, glue them in place, clamp the tip. Um, you know, that, that'll never change on you. That is thermally very stable. Carbon fiber is very stable thermally. You know, really that's about as solid as it gets. So. That's really it for setting up the linkages, so I'm going to go ahead and do that on everything, and then uh, we're getting close to being ready to fly. Okay, so once you get your stabs, both the linkages hooked up, I'm going to go ahead and throw some, you know, trailing edge guides on there to check the alignment. So, um, really at this point, all I do is I throw them on there, and I just tweak the sub trims a bit to get those in line, right? So I'm just in the sub trim, and I have slightly adjusted... Uh, both elevator halves, just to get those straight. I do try to keep them opposite and equal. So plus 22, minus 22. I don't know why. Maybe it's just being picky. But I do try to balance between the two. So if I got to go, you know, I kind of go up on one, down on the other, just to try to keep them as equal as possible. And then, you know, really you want to track them through the the whole range, you know, both up and down to make sure those are tracking and to fix any tracking issues um, in your elevator screen so it's on the model in the airplane or model menu 
on our elevator. So now I've already tweaked these a bit. So again, I try to split the difference. So if I go up on, so this is elevator and elevator two. So again, my left and my right. So I went 2% more down. Um, and I've actually reduced the elevator two by 2%. So I've split the difference of 4% total on the down elevator. And again, I split the difference on the up elevator, 1% on each side just to get that tracking. So you're just going in there and just tweak the tracking. Again, I don't do this with ATV, I do it with the ele elevator function because the ATV again is going to impact trims and some of those other things, sub trims, etc. Whereas the elevator is just strictly um, for that for that model. Or for for you know that particular condition. So even if you didn't want to, if you were using conditions for you know a spin let's say and your full elevator for a spin you know maybe the elevators didn't track nice at both at both uh, normal flying and spin rates you could actually ungroup this and throw in two different settings one for a spin and one for a normal flying so that you can you can compensate or, or have the alignment exactly perfect in both conditions Normally I find good servos if the linkage geometry is very close. Two, three percent is pretty typical. Um, there's I think always some subtle differences in the servos and just in the exact geometries that you get after sanding and and drilling the holes, etc, etc. So I'm usually pretty okay with a couple percent. Um, if I had 10 percent I'd probably start to get a little concerned and I might go start doing some mechanical adjustments. Um, you could probably dial this in, you know, right to perfection um, with some mechanical adjustments, but for a couple percent, it doesn't, it doesn't really bother me. Same with sub trim, you know, 20, 20 points on sub trim, not really a big deal. If there was a hundred points, obviously we've got something seriously messed up. Uh, so you want to go back and fix that. So, so that's basically it for the elevator half alignments. Um, and really any further tweaking I'll do during during trimming. Okay, so I'm setting up the aileron servo. So I put the servo in the same and I angled it using the same principle as the as the stab. And I've centered the servo arm already. Now, one thing slightly different here is you know, because I haven't drilled these points like I did for the I had the hard point already drilled for the stab. You know, I'm just going to use that drill to sort of line up where my square needs to hit. I'm using a four cross on the outermost hole. And when I drew my center line down, down along the aileron. So I'm using these style of horns. Um, so I've also made a mark there at 11 millimeters. So what I've done is I've taken my square and I've really placed it, you know, like on the same flat surface as the as the horn. Right? So I've taken that like that and I've just measured from the edge of the square to the hole, that's 11 millimeters. And so that gives me, you know, how far back I need to offset the front of this part of the horn so that I know that the, the rotation points over the center of the hinge line. So that's that 11 millimeters. So the other thing is when you're using a, and a ball link, a ball bearing link like this, you know, it's set offset from this. So I can't just put this, you know, right on the line or else, you know, I'm going to be at some angle. And really that's not so bad. But what I'm going to do is I'm basically going to set these so that the inside face of this horn is on this line. So it will make this push rod sit slightly inward, just a little bit. But that's okay because at max deflection, you know, this moves over quite a bit. So it'll be a little bit inward here, but when I get out to max deflection, it'll actually be pointed outward. So I'm kind of splitting the difference a little bit on the location. Instead of having that perfectly straight, it's going to be just a bit in, and it'll be just a bit out when it's deflected. So I'm basically going to line that up and mark those holes and drill them. Okay, so I got my holes drilled in there. I just use the same drill that I used for the servo. You know, remove the tape. I'm just going to go screw that horn in place now and start working on setting up the... Uh, the linkage the exact same way as the stab with the carbon fiber rod. So here's the final installed horn on the aileron. You see it's just slightly inward. Now, you know, I with this horn I can't quite get to 25 degrees, I get close, 22 or something. 
Um, so I may have to go to actually even a bigger one. If I do, and I don't like this being inclined, I can always flip this to the outside. So, you know, I'm kind of, that's why I sort of split the difference on it. It'll be a little bit inboard, or if you put a bigger arm, I can be outboard. You know, give yourself a bit of flexibility. But that's basically what the, the aileron looks like, you know, and again, pretty much centered on the uh, trailing edge. And so, yeah, that's that's pretty much wraps up the wing. So I do the other aileron exactly the same. Okay, starting to tidy up the fuse here for the final little, you know, cutouts and whatnot. So I just cut this uh, servo access, servo lead access point out. Um, you really just, I drew this black line from the bottom of the stab tube to the bottom of the anti-rotation pin. That's, the, that's where the former is. And then I really just, you know, cut out a, you know, kind of a two inch by half inch hole there, you know, for the servo lead. And then really, it just, you can kind of see the former just inside there. It's just on the edge of the former. And, you know, the former's got a hole in it, so that's going to, you know, our elevator, or rudder servo cable is going to come up through that and connect into our S-Bus cable with our elevator leads. So do that on both sides, and that basically is going to get you your access point for your elevator servo cables. So now that we got the uh, rudder hinged up, we'll set the linkage up. So again, we got our servo in here. You know, I did the rails and everything the same way as the other the other servos. Um, I'm using a Dubro horn because it's just slightly longer than the standard Futaba one. You know, I've put my clevis style link on here. Um, and I've just, you know, made this perpendicular to the to the servo. Um, just because when we did this, this servo cutout was done perpendicular to the uh, hinge line. So that way it makes it a little bit easier. As long as this is perpendicular to the servo, you're you're good. So, um, to center the rudder, because you don't have a cap on this particular model, I've done, I've used my, my aluminum squares, and I've clamped them at the back here, and I've just taped them to the fuse at the front. Um, I did shim them a little bit here, so when they were touching the rudder back here to zero, there was a bit of a gap, so you could kind of wiggle just slightly, so I got a 32nd inch shim here just to take that gap up. So really everything's nice and, nice and tight in there now. And centered right so that, that's got my rudder center position fixed if you had a cap on top of the rudder you could just use the cap um, but this this way would work uh, with or without the cap um, to get you a nice nice center point start on the rudder again just the regular ball link here and this clevis link at the back you know which is which is this style so that's gonna go in there and then again we're just gonna use the carbon rod um, and the CA in between um, the two, and that'll that'll lock in our rudder setting. So once your glue is set up on your push rod, you can take the support rails bars off of there, and you pretty much got uh, your rudder set up. Um, also, you know if your hinge line's cured, you know go ahead and pull your pin out um, and clean up any kind of excess glue that that. Uh, got into the into the hinges. Um, sometimes you may need to twist that rod a little bit just to sort of break it free if a glue, bit of glue get in there, but it should come out fairly fairly easily. Um, and then yeah, you can go ahead and put that back together. Uh, and basically you're you're finished up on setting the rudder hinges and the linkage. So I'm just working on slowly setting up the equipment. So I'm just running the S-Bus cable to the tail so you can kind of see it hanging out there. So I got that much hanging out when the lead, the end of the S-Bus cable sticking out here. So instead of having extensions running off this to my elevator halves, I'll just have this, and if I do need to pull off the stab halves, um, the servos will directly plug into here. You know, and then once they're in, I'll just pull this, uh, pull this lead forward and plug it into my terminal block. So that's why I'm putting this in first, so I can kind of locate where that terminal block uh, needs to sit when that S-Bus cable is, is kind of retracted back into the fuselage. Okay, so to mount the receiver, um, I just built a little mounting pad like this, so it's just some 8th inch balsa with some very thin, like 64th ply, just to stiffen it up, um, and just a couple strips of 8th inch balsa. So that way the, you know, this these can be glued to the fuse, and then I can have some Velcro in here, Velcro in here, and then I can just run a strap kind of around the receiver. So it's just easy to, to remove it without having... Um, just having sticky velcro to the fuse, which can sometimes come off. So a little more, a uh, little more robust mounting. Um, 
super light, doesn't really weigh anything, and very easy to make up. So same thing for the receiver pack. You can make you can make these sorts of things, um, whatever, just to just to help mount into these to the side insides of the fuselages. Okay, I got my receiver mounted on my little uh, mount there, and I've actually drawn a couple points for the antenna. So the antennas do need to be 90 degrees to each other. So I did use a just a little square just to kind of go in there and get them at 90. Now they can be almost any position like this you know, like that, I mean, whatever, just whatever fits in your fuse, and I am routing them up and kind of away from the carbon. Um, there's a bit of carbon in the front here, so this one's going to get close, but, you know, generally they're, you know, don't run them through that main carbon strip there on the fuse. And to hold them, I just use these little plastic tube mounts. You can get these also at Morris Hobbies, um, but anything, if you just get plastic tube at the hobby store or tape, I've seen people use the mushroom head Velcro to kind of clamp them in. Whatever, it doesn't really matter, just as long as they're they're 90 degrees to each other. So for the terminal block, um, I'm just going to glue it to the fuse. I cut off the ears. I use I leave this one on just so I get a bit more gluing surface. And I just glued a eighth inch piece of balsa just to space it off the fuse a little bit further. So when you're plugging in these back cables, um, you just got just that much extra room. I find it's pretty tight if you're right up against the fuse. So, and I'm just going to glue that right onto the fuse um, where all the cables line up. So there's a terminal block glued in there. Um, that's the S bus cable back to the tail. That's the S bus cable going to the receiver. And then this one I'm just going to use to plug the two ailerons into. This is just a short 100 millimeter one. Oh, that's 1,000 millimeter. And then on the receiver, you know, this is just another short, like, uh, maybe 80 millimeter male to male and then I do have one of those noise filters if you have a recommends on that on that cable as well so the next thing to do is mount your switch if you're using one you know wherever you're gonna mount that so I finish up my switch install just above the wing kind of in between the wing and the t-can so it's not super visible there it is on the inside I did add a little eighth inch piece of balsa just to sort of back it up a little bit um, <coughs> So then if you need to extend this lead to reach your receiver battery, it's fine. And then I also got my, I also got the uh, extension put on for the um, speed control down in there. So it just plugs up into the receiver, channel 3. You know, tape that down nice so it's out of the way. Um, and really... That's basically it for getting your receiver and connections done on an S-Bus model. Okay, to mount the receiver pack, one of the kind of last things I do, A, I like to have it um, accessible so you can, you know, easily change it, um, but not kind of in the way. Uh, and I want to be able to, you know, voltage test the, the pack if necessary. So I've built another little, little wooden mount like that. So I'm actually going to mount it, you know, kind of up in front of the wing tube, um, about there, close to the switch, so I don't have a bunch of extra cable. Um, but you know, easy enough. All I really need to do is take the T can off um, if I do want to test the voltage, or I could probably even reach in through here and do it um, if I was in a hurry. And if I do need to change the pack again, I just need to take the T can off. I don't even need to take the canopy off. So if, if for whatever reason, just pop that T can up and away I go. So again, just roughing it up. I'm just gonna CA that in place and it'll just be held in there like that. So pretty straightforward. Okay, we're continuing to work through some of the radio setup. Um, so I'm running the D3 ESC in this model. So that's the, the one from Adam uh, Dubovsky with uh, the governor. And so in that controller, you know, you need you got a bit of a manual here, right? And you need to set that so that um, there's a thousand millisecond or microsecond pulse width for closed throttle and two thousand microsecond for full throttle. So what what does that mean, and how do you figure that out? So there's a few ways to do this. Um, this is an ISDT uh, battery checker, the BG8S. Um, I think a Jetty Box does it. Uh, there's probably some other servo testers out on the market that do it as well. So to get this set up, really you need an extension uh, from your receiver channel, so channel 3 on, on the Futaba. 
you need uh, a power supply. This is just a 4S LiPo. So you want to hook in the receiver plug to the negative, so the negative portion, the negative power to the negative on the balance connection. And it, it does, the pins do fit. You know, and energize this thing up with your battery. And that's just a XT60 connector there. And really in here, you go into the function menu, right? Um, so to get out of here, you go from the main menu to function, up to receiver tester. And because you're in PWM, uh, you need to be in PWM, it will read SBUS as well, but because the throttle's in PWM, you need to go into that and you read that. And if it's powered up right, you'll see some kind of signals on here. So percentage and then the microsecond. So you'll notice if I move the throttle, right, I get some change in output. So I haven't made any adjustments to the transmitter yet. Okay, so on the transmitter, I'm gonna go to my uh, language. So right now it's reverse, so full throttle gives me, you know, 1100. And I'd also obviously that's backwards, so we need to reverse the throttle on, uh, if I can find it, there it is. So always with you to have a throttle's reversed. So you'll see now that flips 1941. So <clears throat> if you remember, uh, we need to be 2000 on full throttle and 1000 at idle or at low throttle. So on the throttle, I'm going to go up. And as you'll notice, as I'm increasing that ATV, that's going up. So we're going to turn that up to 2000. And it's 114%. And at idle, and I'm actually going to go out of here for a second, and I'm going to trim this down all the way, because I want to make sure this is it fully bottom trimmed. So it's actually 980, so I'm going to adjust that slightly. So we're going to lower that, in fact, and not by much, right? Like I'll probably just go a little bit under, so 996, call it. So basically there I'm at 1,000 at idle and 2000 at full. So that's full throttle. There's no point in making any adjustments to AFR or the ATV. That is going to give you full throttle on this controller and then this is going to give you the minimum which is basically an arm or a stop on it. Um, so you have to go down minimum trim to arm it and then obviously as you trim up from there you know you're going to get some kind of output to the controller and a certain amount of RPM. And that's really all there is to it, um, to setting up the D3 endpoints. Uh, they are fixed, they, this will never change. Um, you could basically move this from model to model. In fact, 114 was the same number on my 18. At the low end's a little bit different. I just used 100, um, but it's very, very close, obviously between the 18 and the, and the 32. So that really sets up just the base ATV program of the throttle. Don't change the upper and lower endpoints in AFR. Leave those both at 100%. Um, the lower one you can adjust it, I guess, if you want less, you know, braking. Uh, but the upper one, it really will give you no benefit to change it because it's already at full throttle at 100%. Okay, so I'm going to continue with setting up the radio. So depending on how you like to set it up, this may or not, may not be terribly applicable to you. Uh, but I am definitely like using conditions. So you'll notice I still have condition number one in the transmitter. So haven't set any of them up yet. So I'm going to go ahead and set my conditions up. Um, however you like to set your conditions, you know, everybody's a little bit different. So you'll have to, uh, you'll have to, you know, do it. You know, basically, if you've got a, you know, I usually like to do it all the same time every single time, same way every single time. So if you've got a preferred method, you know, just apply that. So in the in the model menu, which is there, um, under condition select. So usually I like to just rename condition number one to normal. You know, and this is just sort of my base general flying condition. So typically I would have, um, you know, snaps, maybe one or two snap conditions, a stall turn, a spin, and then I do usually put a landing condition in. I like to set them all up first um, and then ungroup the settings afterwards. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go in here and load everyone. You basically go, 
you just add a condition you can pick which one you want um, you can rename it so this one I'm just gonna rename snap you know and you can assign a switch so I always assign the same switches every time just so it's consistent from plane to plane so my snap is uh, switch C in the up position so you can test that and it should change to snap up there so normal snap the middle obviously is normal so if I I gotta get it all the way up right and you just keep going loading it on um, so I'm gonna load all my conditions in here and then we'll come back so I got all my conditions loaded in there um, so yes there are seven so stall turns snaps vertical snaps and you know I may not use the vertical snap one but I load them in anyways spin spin low elevator rate and then landing um, so there is a reason for this order you know the order these are in are in priority they call it so um, when you see priority you can adjust that so f what that means is effectively the last condition in here always takes priority so for instance if you're in let's say the snap roll condition and I go turn on my landing condition because it's later in the list it will take priority so it'll overrule the snap so that's why my landing is last so if I flip that landing switch on there's no way for me to accidentally turn a snap condition on a spin you know a stall turn condition on etc etc um, you know so whatever you know however you want to set that up for your own list of conditions you know is up to you if you do have say for instance um, I don't know a maneuver let's say something with uh, uh, you know you need a lot of rudder throw so maybe you're maybe you're using a stall turn condition right um, to get yourself a lot of rudder throw um, something in the unknowns and it's got a snap in it that's why I have my snap after that so if I'm using that and I get to the top and I need to do a snap roll at the top of say a say a triangle or something and I don't want to have to flip two switches I can leave the stall turn condition in place do the maneuver flip into my snap condition flip out of my snap condition I go right back into the stall turn so you may play with this priority right as you go through a specific sequence you're like oh I want to I don't want to have to flip the second switch so you can use that priority to do that <clears throat> so once you have all these set up um, I usually like to kind of set my throttle curve up first so in here under throttle I should show you that go back to AFR under throttle you know, make sure you're on the throttle there's a GR so group um, so if you want always set up your normal condition first so your kind of low rates first because you're going to want to leave everything as grouped as much as possible so for instance in a stall turn condition you may only want to give yourself more elevator more rudder you want to leave your aileron alone you don't want to adjust it so in that condition you're going to leave your aileron grouped um, so if you set it up first you'd have to actually ungroup it and then set it up in every single condition so by setting up kind of your baseline condition it just allows it to be a little bit faster so for throttle I'm gonna do it first um, so I'm gonna leave it grouped now generally I like to use uh, for this exp2 so it just you could use a just a curve like a spline or a line and add a bunch of points I find the XP2 gets me what I need and I can I can play with it um, and get pretty close so and I'm just copying this off my other models so for full for the low end right and this is really your braking is I'm gonna run uh, I run at 97 and a half and you can adjust this up or down for braking this EXP I'm gonna run at 67 percent positive so that's gonna get me to crank this curve up like that I'm actually going to offset it up and the reason why I offset it up is is really just to sort of get that midpoint throttle where I want it and then because I offset that up I need to decrease this top end down to 80 so that gets me a hundred percent at full throttle you know it's basically minus 99 percent at, at idle um, you know and at the mid stick it's running at 61 percent 
So, you know, however you get this curve, it's really up to you um, and what feels right to you. But that's, that's basically my base starting curve. I do use a speed of 20. So that slows the in and out down. So you can't really see it here, but if you go back to servo monitor, if you watch the throttle when I throttle down, that's the transit time to idle. And that's the transit time to full throttle. So it does take a bit of time. It takes the jumpiness out of the airplane, I find. So now you have that um, set up in, in your main group. Um, so I'm going to leave that the same. So now you see it's the same in normal, vertical snap, everywhere, right? Okay, so now that we have that set up in the normal, um, really the only one I change is the landing one. Um, you could change the spin one as well. It, it's kind of up to you. Uh, what your preferences are, but I'll show you the landing, which is what I'm doing on landing is really just to drop that low end idle down um, quite a bit lower because I do find the the main speed is pretty high. The low end rate's minus 74.5, so I want to get that lower. This is about probably 1400 RPM the way this is set up, so that's pretty high um, to try to land with the D3, so we definitely need to drop that down, and you can't really arm it if you're in this mode. So we're going to flip over to landing condition, and then we're going to ungroup it. So that's going to allow this to be different from all the rest of the conditions. So I'm going to tweak this with what I got from other planes. So this is up to like 105. This rate is up to like 100. This offset's at zero. And my curve is up to 72 and a half. So really I'm trying to kind of get you know close to that midpoint you know and then now you notice I'm down at minus 102 I'm still at plus 100 so my full stick is always the same but my got a lot less uh, idle speed and really at mid trim this would arm you um, or at lo low trim this should arm the controller and then at mid trim it should give a very low idle you could tweak this bottom end rate A you know just to sort of give you um, whatever kind of idle speed you might want um, at landing. So I, I've got that set so when I'm at neutral trim it's kind of where I want it. So once you're in single you can't go back to group. Um, that's the one downside of this. You want to make sure that uh, you pick the right singles. So if you're just, if you're just to push this back to group, say, oh I made a mistake I want to go back to my my normal throttle. Uh, if you were to push that to group, it would it would make this the group now. So you don't want to, you don't want to go back once you've created this. If you do want to regroup this, you have to manually match it back to the main group, and then hit group, and then it will then it will be the same. <coughs> um, yeah, it's it's a bit pain. The more of these you kind of set up, the the more struggle that ends up being. So you could. Um, you know, if you're to switch in any other condition now, you'll notice they're all the same with the exception of, of that landing one. And again, because that is the last, it's going to override it, right? So up to you how you kind of want it set up. But that's how you set up the, the group and single um, within the conditions. Uh, so you can save yourself a lot of time doing this. So now I'm going to do, you know, you're going to go through and do all of your, all of your other ones. Again, I'm going to largely copy... Uh, what I've done on the other models, but um, you know, it's just going to be you're going to duplicate up every single sort of setup that you have, uh, right? So the aileron, you're going to have a main, and then you're going to ungroup it, go to singles for say a snap condition, right? But you're only going to do the ones you want to change. So if you if you want to leave the elevator the same, just leave it grouped, and then it'll always track whatever your normal normal condition is. So I'm going to set a few of these up and I'll come back and just show them to you rather than going through each and every single one. So I'm just going to walk you through the aileron here. Um, so I did go and I basically have a sheet that I copied from my other model, you know, and it's it's really just a matrix of all the settings, you know, the different conditions and then the three different surfaces <coughs> um, with each. So then, you know, these are obviously grouped. There's more adjustment on the elevator rudder. I don't do a lot with the ailerons, it's largely just stays in the group except for snaps, but the elevator rudder have a few more few more settings. So I'm just gonna walk you through the aileron here just real quick. Um, so generally normal you want you know you want to change this to EXP1 which gives you your exponential. 
obviously leave it as group. If you want to display more than one, you can you can put AFR, you can do all conditions, which is what I'll do just to, so you can see it as I go through. So really I've just set this, I got this at minus 39. And I'm, you know, because this is a new model, I'm just starting from what I had on my other plane. Uh, I'm not gonna maybe make it exactly the same. Um, but just close enough. It'll be it'll be close enough to start with. I always run this in separate. You could put it combined, but then you can't independently adjust the left and the right or the up or the down. So the expo I had a minus 32, so it's always negative in Futaba land. Um, so really that sets the aileron curve up. So that's our normal condition. <clears throat> so snaps. Now I, I want a different rate and stuff, so I'm going to ungroup it. And then in that condition, always make sure you're in the right condition or you're going to overwrite your group. We're going to crank this up to, I'm just going to go to 125, it was 120. In fact, I might even go to 140 because that gives me the most throw I can get right now. And then my expo was 60. So that's that group, or that single. So you'll notice I have two curves, so there's the normal and the snap. And then the vertical snap, I'm going to do the same one. So unfortunately you can't group two like this. I couldn't have, even though they're both the same, I can't make them into a sort of separate subset group. It would be nice if you could have more than one group, because this would definitely save you some time. This is a bit of the drawback of, the, um, of doing conditions, is when you do have lots of conditions sometimes you end up you know making a bunch of subtle adjustments in each one but there is more flexibility so so you know those two overlap exactly so there's my basically my conditions and again if I go into a different one obviously these override it so that's really setting up the aileron so I'm gonna pound through elevator and rudder um, they are exactly the same. I do the, I do the same, same sort of functionality um, with those. Okay, so I've got these all done. Just want to show you a few things. Um, on the rudder, so I do use speed in and out 13. Now I do change that on the snaps right to zero. So that's one of the beauties of the conditions. You can do that. If you were just running dual rates, you would not be able to change that. Um, and it just allows the, the rudder to get in there faster. Um, so on some of these, you'll notice like the spin or whatever, I do have quite a bit of, uh, or pardon me, the stall turn, I have quite a bit of expo. And the reason why I do that, it's not because I need it for that, that it's just when I'm flipping switches, you'll notice the rate, let's say here's 5%. So I was to take, if I was holding the rudder in for whatever reason, and I flip that switch from say, you know, I'm holding 4% in there and I flip it, it's it's basically the same, right? So that's really why I'm kind of putting those expos in there is so when I'm transitioning from one switch to another, um, you know, I'm not really getting a movement in the surface. You know, if that doesn't bother you, you know, then you don't, maybe don't need to do that, but something to consider. On the elevator for the spin, the reason why I have low and high rate, so I do run a high rate, right? For getting into the spin, then really once that plane is about ready to stall, I just drop this switch back to the middle, and that pulls all the elevator out, and it leaves me in effectively in uh, low rate elevator, but still uh, my higher rate rudder. So that's gonna, you know, it just helps get that really defined nose drop. Probably shouldn't tell people that they'll maybe zero my spins going forward, but um, hopefully not. But yeah, I do that. So essentially, your high rate, you know, as you as you approach, and I hit full stick, and that plane's ready to go. I just drop that out. Boom! There goes the elevator, and then you go into your into your normal spin. You can probably manage it by hand too. I'm I'm lazy that way. The switch is pretty easy. So that's why it's on that same it's on the same switch, just in the middle position. So that's basically all these set up. So now I want to go and we want to kind of check out the model and everything everything makes sense. Okay, so we got that model energized up. Um, you know, so test that basically all your throws are obviously going the right way. You know, so everything's going good for me. So that's my normal condition. And if you want, you can throw on a throw meter. You can use something like this. These are old CRC ones. Um, 
I do have one of these. This is actually AT Wizard from Digitech. Um, there's a few different few different versions of this one. You can get one that plugs into a battery and has a local readout, or this one actually has a Bluetooth app. So if you turn it on, it connects up, and then basically, you know, it tells you your throw. So it works pretty good. It's just a little tricky to, to hold in place. For the purpose of this, I'm just going to throw the old CRC on here, you know, and zero that out. So really, my ailerons, I got about eight degrees of up, you know, and seven degrees of down, something like that. You know, I don't have any differential programmed into this yet or anything, so, you know, that's pretty good. Snaps, I'm running about 24. You know, down's maybe just a hair less, so. So that's just sort of the base, like say, just copying from other planes. On the elevator, you know, I got about, that's about 11 degrees or so of, what's so snap, or about eight degrees of up and about nine degrees of down. And then on the snap, it was about 12 up, maybe 13, 14 down. You know, and on the spin high rate, I got like 17, 18 up, and about the same down. You know, um, so on the spin, I'll show you that. That's There's the high rate on the spin, and then that's the low rate. That's the switch to drop that out. So really, that's just up is the high rate, and down is dropping out, right? And then uh, on the, you see the servo slow on the rudder. If I switch to the snap rate, you notice it's quite a bit faster, and then back to the slow. And even the stall turns is nice and slow. So if I were to put this in and just let it out, you see you don't get a bit of that tail leg from that. You now it's a bit slow. So I got that on my spin and my my snap, my stall turn, and my normal flying condition. You'll notice if you run on lower rudder on the normal plane, it's pretty fast. Like it, it's it tracks the stick pretty quick. And generally, you know, we're moving the sticks pretty slow, so you don't really see it. But if you did happen to to hammer it too fast, you're not going to get some of those wiggles. Um, so that's generally the the setup. And really, I'll do all the other fine tuning in the air. I don't bother to, you know, really go through ups and downs and make sure they're exact. I want to fly the plane first, see how it flies, and then. You know, I'm going to make a determination as to what changes I need to make to the model uh, at that point. So, I'm just going to show you the motor setup um, real quick. So generally I want to always arm it in my normal because it won't, I want to plug the battery in I guess, it won't arm in, in normal um, and at low trim. So that way even if you weren't in normal, um, the motor's off. So after every flight I trim down anyways. So I'm going to go ahead and power this up. And you will get a beep. You'll get that beep. Now that is not armed. Um, if I was to, to hit the throttle, you know, it's not armed. So in order to arm it, I need to flip over to landing mode. So I'm just going to do that. So you notice it arms at, at low. Now, as I engage that trim up, it's going to activate the motor. A little bit of a rough start because I'm going slow. Normally I have that trim step a little bit higher so it'll it'll kick in. Um, so it's engaged there at 23. That's probably a little bit low. Normally I'd run that a bit higher. You know, I don't have my tack, but I'd have to, I'd probably set that up at like three, 400 RPM, somewhere in there. So that's neutral, that's probably pretty fast. So now, if I switch to my normal flying mode, this is going to speed up. So that would be normal flight. Um, you know, and again, you can adjust that based on how you how you want to how you want to fly the model and what kind of braking you have. Um, for my spin, my spin's the same. I can I can lower that for the spin if I find that. Uh, uh, you know it's too fast for the spin but again you can adjust that for your own flying and where your altitude is so there so if we adjust that trim rate to go a little bit faster in the landing condition yeah like right now that step is set to six so I'm gonna go ahead and set that step up to like 10 or maybe even 15 
So I'm going to get a little bit more reaction out of it now when I trim it up. Yeah, there you go. So, so if I just hit this trim, you know, it kicks in pretty good. And that's probably not a bad, a bad idle point, you know. But you do got to kind of get out and tack it. And I just trimmed down, kills the motor. Now in real life, this motor probably is not completely dead. You know, if you were actually landing and trimmed all the way down, it would probably slowly turn over. There is a pile of brake on, on those motors um, with that controller when they're set to idle like that. So that's really how I set up the D3. You know, I've only been playing with it since last July. I really got it right before the World Championships. Um, you know, and I haven't spent a lot of time tweaking that setup. There's probably a more intelligent way to, to do it than the way I've done it. Um, but it does work. You know, it's functional. It gives you lots of flexibility for different flight conditions uh, to set that idle speed up and braking. Um, you know, for me, I fly at 35, 3,600 feet above sea level. So braking up here is quite a bit different than, say, if I travel to, uh, to a sea level uh, field. So I do like to have some flexibility in those setups. I can, I can tune it and adjust it. If you fly pretty consistently at the same altitude, maybe you don't need that. So really, again, it's quite a bit of personal preference. Um, but that basically sets up my basic programming that I'm going to do on the bench. Again, double check all your linkages and bolts and whatnot that everything's in place. And then I think really uh, we're ready to go fly.